Now back to Martin Luther King with his fifth and final Massey lecture. The other four were recorded in a studio in Atlanta. But the fifth was something different. It was not a lecture, but a sermon that Dr. King delivered in his own church, the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. It was Christmas Eve, 1967, and he took the opportunity to share his message of nonviolence with a larger audience. Oh, I love Jesus. On Christmas Eve, the CBC presents Dr. Martin Luther King's Christmas Sermon on Peace and Nonviolence as the fifth and final Massey Lecture for 1967. Peace on Earth. This Christmas season finds us a rather bewildered human race. We neither have peace within nor peace without. Everywhere paralyzing fears harrow people by day and haunt them by night. And our world is sick with war. Everywhere we turn, we see its ominous possibilities. And yet, my friends, the Christmas hope for peace and goodwill toward all men can no longer be dismissed as a kind of pious dream of some utopian hoper. If we don't have goodwill toward men in this world, we will destroy ourselves by the misuse of our own instruments and our own power. Yes, sir. Wisdom born of experience should tell us that war is obsolete. There may have been a time when war served as a negative good by preventing the spread and growth of an evil force. Make it plain. But the very destructive power of modern weapons of warfare eliminates even the possibility that war may any longer serve as a negative good. And so if we assume that life is worth living, if we assume that mankind has a right to survive, then we must find an alternative to war. And so let us this morning explore the conditions for peace. And as we explore these conditions, I would like to suggest that modern man really go all out to study the meaning of nonviolence, its philosophy and its strategy. We have experimented with the meaning of nonviolence in our struggle for racial justice in the United States. But now, the time has come for man to experiment with nonviolence in all areas of human conflict. And that means nonviolence on an international scale. Now let me suggest first that if we are to have peace on earth, our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. No individual can live alone No nation can live alone, and as long as we try, the more we are going to have war in this world. The judgment of God is upon us. Yes, sir. And we must either learn to live together as brothers, 
or we are all going to perish together as fools. Yes, as nations and individuals, we are interdependent. I've mentioned to you before of our visit to India some years ago. It was a marvelous experience. But I say to you this morning that there were those depressing moments. For how can one avoid being depressed when he sees with his own eyes evidences of millions of people going to bed hungry at night? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How can one avoid being depressed when he sees with his own eyes thousands of people sleeping on the sidewalks at night. More than a million people sleep on the sidewalks of Bombay, India every night. More than a half a million sleep on the sidewalks of Calcutta every night. They have no houses to go in. They have no beds to sleep in. As I beheld these conditions, something within me cried out, can we in America stand idly by and not be concerned? And an answer came, oh no. And I started thinking about the fact that right here in our country, we spend millions of dollars every day to store surplus food. Make it plain. And I said to myself, I know where we can store that food free of charge. In the wrinkled stomachs of the millions of God's children in Asia and Africa, Latin America, and even in our own nation who go to bed hungry at night. It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny, and whatever affects one directly yes, sir. affects all indirectly. We are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. And did you ever stop to think that you can't leave for your job in the morning without being dependent on most of the world. Yes. You get up in the morning and go to the bathroom and reach over for a sponge, and that's handed to you by a Pacific Islander. You reach for a bar of soap, and that's given to you at the hands of a Frenchman. And then you go in the kitchen to drink your coffee for the morning, and that's poured in your cup by a South American. Or maybe you want tea that's poured in your cup by a Chinese. Or maybe you are desirous of having cocoa for breakfast and that's poured in your cup by a West African. And then you reach over for your toast and that's given to you at the hands of an English speaking farmer, not to mention the baker. And before you finish eating breakfast in the morning, you are dependent on more than half of the world. Yes, this is the way our universe is structured. It is its interrelated quality. We aren't going to have peace on earth until we recognize this basic fact of the interrelated structure of all reality. Now let me say secondly that if we are to have peace in the world men and nations must embrace the nonviolent affirmation that ends and means must cohere. One of the great philosophical debates of history has been over the whole question of means and ends. And there have always been those who argued that the end justifies the means, that the means really aren't important. 
The important thing is to get to the end you seek. So if you are seeking to develop a just society, the important thing is to get that, and the means uh, really aren't important. Any means that will get you there. They may, may be violent. They may be untruthful means. They may even be unjust means to get to a just end. There have been those who have argued this throughout history. But we will never have peace in the world until men everywhere recognize that ends are not cut off from means because the means represent the ideal in the making and the end in process. And ultimately, you can't reach good ends through evil means because the means represent the seed and the end represents the tree. It's one of the strangest things that all of the great military geniuses of the world have talked about peace. The conquerors of old came killing in pursuit of peace. Alexander, Julius Caesar, Charlemagne, and Napoleon were akin in seeking a peaceful world order. And do you know if you will read Mein Kampf close enough Hitler contended that everything that he did in Germany was for peace. And the leaders of the world today talk eloquently about peace. Every time we drop our bombs in North Vietnam, President Johnson is talking eloquently about peace. Make it plain. Make it plain. What is the problem? They are talking about peace as a distant goal, as an end we seek. But one day we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but it is a means by which we arrive at that goal. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. All of this is saying that in the final analysis, means and ends must cohere because the end is pre-existent in the means. And ultimately, destructive means cannot bring about constructive ends. Now let me say the next thing we must be concerned about if we are to have peace on earth, goodwill toward men, must be the nonviolent affirmation of the sacredness of all human life. Life is sacred. Every man is somebody because he is a child of God. Yes. And so when we say thou shall not kill, we are really saying that human life is too sacred yes. to be killed on the battlefields of the world. Man is more than a tiny vagary of whirling electrons out of wisp of smoke from a limitless smoldering. Man is a child of God made in his image. Yes. And therefore must be respected as such. Until men see this everywhere, until nations see this everywhere, we will be fighting wars, one day somebody should remind us that even though there may be political and ideological differences, the Vietnamese are our brothers. Yes, yes. The Russians are our brothers. The yes. Chinese yes. are our brothers. And one day, one day, 
We've got to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. But in Christ, that is neither Jew nor Gentile. In Christ, that is neither male nor female. In Christ, that is neither communist nor capitalist. In Christ, somehow, that is neither bond nor free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And when we truly believe in the sacredness of human personality, we won't exploit people. Right. We won't trample over people with our own feet of oppression. We won't kill anybody. There are three words for love in the Greek New Testament. One is the word eros. And eros is a sort of aesthetic, romantic love. Plato used to talk about it a great deal in his dialogues, the yearning of the soul for the realm of the divine. And there is and can always be something beautiful about eros, even in its expressions of romance. Some of the most beautiful love in all of the world has been expressed this way. And then the Greek language talks about phileo, which is another word for love. Amphileo is a kind of intimate love between personal friends. This is the kind of love that you have for those people that you get along with well and those that you like on this level. You love because you are loved. You love those people that appeal to you and those that you like. Then the Greek language comes out with another word for love. It is a word agape. agape. Agape is more than romantic love. It is more than friendship. Agape is understanding, creative, redemptive, goodwill for all men. Agape is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. Theologians would say that it is the love of God operating in the human heart. Yes. And so when you rise to love on this level, you love all men, not because you like them, not because their ways appeal to you, but you love every man because God loves him. That's it. That's and this is what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies. And I'm happy that he didn't say like your enemies because there are some people that I find it pretty difficult to like. Like is an affectionate emotion and I can't like anybody bombing my home. I can't like anybody who would exploit me. I can't like anybody who would trample over me with injustices. I can't like them. I can't like anybody who threatens to kill me day in and day out. But Jesus reminds us that love is greater than like. Yes, sir. Love is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. And I think this is where we are as a people in our struggle for racial justice. We can't ever give up. We must work passionately and unrelentingly for first-class citizenship. We must never let up in our determination to remove every vestige of segregation and discrimination from our nation. But we shall not in the process relinquish our privilege to love. I've seen too much hate to want to hate myself. I've seen hate on the faces of too many sheriffs, too many white citizens, counselors, and too many Klansmen of the South to want to hate myself. And every time I see it, I say to myself, hate is too great a burden to bear. Yes. And somehow, we must be able to stand up before our most bitter opponents and say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity 
to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will and we will still love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws and abide by the unjust system because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good and so force in jail. And we will still love you, bomb our homes and threaten our children, and as difficult as it is, we will still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our communities at the midnight hour and drag us out on some wayside road and leave us half dead as you beat us and we will still love you. Send your propaganda agents around the country and make it appear that we are not fit culturally and otherwise for integration, but we'll still love you. But be ye assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. And one day we will win our freedom. We will not only win freedom for ourselves, yes, we will so appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process. And our victory yes. will be a double victory. And if that is to be peace on earth and goodwill toward men, we must finally believe in the ultimate morality of the universe and believe that all reality hinges on moral foundations. Something must remind us of this as we somehow stand in the Christmas season and think of the Easter season simultaneously, for the two somehow go together. Christ came to show us the way. Men loved darkness rather than the light, and they crucified him. And there on Good Friday on the cross, it was still dark. But then Easter came, and Easter is an eternal reminder of the fact that truth crushed earth will rise again. Easter justifies Carlisle in saying, no lie can live forever. And so this is our faith. And as we continue to hope for peace on earth and goodwill toward men, let us know that in the process, we have cosmic companionship. Yes. In 1963, on a sweltering August afternoon, we stood in Washington, D.C. We talked to the nation about many things. And toward the end of that afternoon, I tried to talk to the nation about a dream that I'd had. And I must confess to you today that not long after talking about that dream, I started seeing it turn into a nightmare. I remember the first time I saw that dream turned into a nightmare, just a few weeks after I had talked about it. It was when four beautiful, unoffending, innocent Negro girls were murdered in a church in Birmingham, Alabama. I watched that dream turn into a nightmare as I moved through the ghettos of the nation and saw my black brothers and sisters perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity and saw the nation really doing nothing to grapple with the Negroes' problem of poverty. I saw that dream turn into a nightmare as I watch my black, black brothers and sisters in the midst of anger and understandable outrage, in the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their disappointment, turn to misguided riots to try to solve that problem. I saw that dream turn to a nightmare as I watched the war in Vietnam escalate. Yes, and as I saw so-called military advisors, 16,000 strong, 
turn into fighting soldiers. And so today, some 500,000 American boys are fighting on Asian soil. Yes, I am personally the victim of deferred dreams, of blasted hopes. But in spite of that, I close today yes, sir. by saying I still have a dream. Because you know you can't give up in life. If you lose hope somehow, you lose that vitality that keeps life moving. You lose that courage to be, that quality that helps you to go on in spite of. And so today I still have a dream. Men will rise up and come to see that they are made to live together as brothers. I still have a dream this morning that one day every Negro in this country, every colored person in the world will be judged on the basis of the content of his character rather than the color of his skin. And every man will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. I still have a dream today that one day the idle industries of Appalachia will be revitalized. And empty stomachs of Mississippi will be filled. And brotherhood will be more than a few words at the end of a prayer but the first order of business on every legislative agenda. I still have a dream yes, today. Yes. And one day, justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I still have a dream today that in all of our state houses and city halls, men will be elected to go there who will do justly yes, and love mercy and walk humbly with their God, I still have a dream today that one day war will come to an end, that men will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Yes. And nations will no longer rise up against nations, neither will they study war anymore. I still have a dream today that one day the lamb and the lion will lie down together and every man will sit under his own vine and fig tree, and none shall be afraid. I still have a dream today that one day every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill will be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. I still have a dream, and with this faith, we will be able to adjourn the councils of despair and bring new light into the dark chambers of pessimism. With this faith, we will be able to speed up the day yes. when there will be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. It will be a glorious day. The morning stars will sing together and the sons of God will shout for joy. Dr. Martin Luther King giving his Christmas sermon in Ebenezer Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia. This is the final Massey Lecture for 1967. The fifth and final Massey Lecture by Martin Luther King, Jr. It aired on the program Ideas on CBC Radio on December the 24th, 1967, at Dr. King's own church, the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Just over three months later, Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Tomorrow on Rewind, we will hear more about that terrible time. <laughs>